We're in the middle of a series called Ready, Set, Grow. And we've been talking about how important it is for us to grow, that it is God's will that every one of us grow. In fact, here's what 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says. It says, let the gift of undeserved grace and the understanding that comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, help you keep on growing. God wants you to keep on growing. And I want you to notice how it happens. It happens by grace, but it doesn't just happen magically. Growth doesn't just magically happen. We've got to get very intentional about the growth that God expects to see within our lives. We've got to get intentional about leaning into that grace that, again, helps us to grow. What we've learned together is that healthy things grow. And that's true of individuals, and through this series, we've talked to you about personal development. We've talked to you about spiritual growth. Last week, we talked about a growing empathy and how important it is as we mature in Christ that we have greater and greater measure of empathy towards the plight of our fellow man. All of these are areas that God wants to see growth in, but there's another area that God wants to see growth in that we need to get intentional about, and that is his church. God wants his church to grow. So today I want to talk to you about a growing church and what role you have in seeing God's church expand. What role you have And seeing to it that the church experiences growth the way that God wants us to. Now, let me tell you a little bit about our story real quickly. Uh, I came back to Lafayette after serving uh, here as a youth pastor in the 80s and 90s. I I came back uh, to Lafayette uh, in 1999 to take the reins uh, as lead pastor of the church. At that time, we were running somewhere between five and 600 people. And we began to see God grow his church. Everybody stepped up. Everybody put the weight of responsibility on our shoulders together. And we begin to grow in strong increment every year. For, for 20 years, we saw great growth. We grew from a church of five to 600 to a church of anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 people every weekend were here pre-COVID uh, leading up to this pandemic that kind of shut everything down. And of course, you know the story. Industry was shut down. Shut down uh, government was shut down. Uh, and of course, churches were shut down. Uh, I'll give you a little report. Since um, we've reopened some months back, since we've reopened, we have steadily increased the number. Uh, Last week, we had over 1,400 people here. Uh, We have anywhere from 50 to 60, maybe even 65% of our pre-COVID numbers that are back attending and uh, regularly are here. That's actually really good compared to the national average. Most churches are running between 30 and 35% of their pre-COVID numbers. Uh, So God's helping us. We're growing again. But how many believe that God wants us to move past all of this, to recapture that momentum where we're back up there, 2,500, 3,000? people and beyond. In fact, I'll be honest with you, my goal is before I hang up my hat and let somebody else take this thing over, I believe we could be running 10,000 people as a church all over Acadiana. Come on, you have faith for that? Say, I do. And and so today I want to talk to you about that, how that happens. I want to talk to you about a growing church. And I want to return to that same passage that I've already uh, cited scripture from, 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, But this time, let's look at verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. Now let's stop for a moment and realize together that the promise he's referring to is the Lord's promise to return, to come back for his own. Peter says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he isn't slow in fulfilling that promise. Watch what his motives are for having waited this long to return. No, he's being patient for your sake. Somebody ought to say thank God. He's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be lost or destroyed, but he wants everyone, he wants everyone to repent. Did you hear the will of God right there in that passage? 
The will of God is that every man, every woman, every boy and every girl in Acadiana would get saved, would know Jesus as their Savior, would get right with God, and would spend eternity with God in the heaven that he's preparing for us all. That's the will of God. That's what God wants. Can I ask a quick question? For every Christ follower here and right there at home, let me ask you. How many of you want what God wants? Raise your hand. I want what God wants. Come on, raise your hand if you want what God wants. You should. If you're his child, if you're a follower of his, you should want what he wants. He wants people saved. He wants people getting right with God. And can I tell you, that's when real church growth happens. It's when people get saved. Now, there will be some folks that will correct me on this mark. And they'll say, no, 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 Jeff, I've known churches that have grown because maybe a group of people got mad at their pastor across town. And, and, and instead of going to that church, they moved over to another church and they started attending there. And a church, you know, that was, you know, one number last week is now 100 people stronger. Isn't that church growth? No, 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 that's just transfer. That's all that is. It's not real kingdom growth. Real kingdom growth doesn't happen unless people give their heart to Christ. Can I tell you, I'm not interested in people coming to us from the other churches of this area. I want to empty the strip clubs. I want to empty the bars and the taverns. I want to empty every hole where darkness is prevailing over people's lives. I want to see people get saved, don't you? It's what God wants and it's what I want and it's what all of us should want and all of us should work toward. I don't know if you realize, but you have a tremendous role in that happening. I think far too often when we think of ministry and we think of ministers, we only think about someone like myself or Pastor Bud or Pastor Paul. We only think of people that, you know, their vocation is full-time serving at a church I want to show you today, we have a role in church growth, but we don't do this alone. In fact, we do this in tandem with you, with God's people. I want to show you that we all have a part to play. In fact, here's what I believe with all my heart, that every member of the church should be a minister of the church. Every member of the church, and I'm not just talking about some official membership where you've gone through a class and signed a covenant. Look, if this is your home church, you're a member of this church. And I believe every member of this church should be a minister of this church. God wants to use you in powerful ways to build his church. Can I stop and say that I believe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the great hope of the world today. And how many know we need all the hope we can get right now? Listen, I believe that God wants to use his church in these hours that we're living in, and you are a part of that church, and God wants to use you in a mighty, mighty way. I want to uh, take and, uh, and share a passage with you from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. Let's look at it together, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, starting in verse 16. It says, a certain man prepared a great banquet and invited many guests. Now, this is one of the many parables that Jesus told. And he says that when it was time for the banquet, the man sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything's now ready. But one after the other, they all began to make excuses. The first one said, I've bought a field and I, don't need, and, and I need to go see it. Please excuse me. And another said, I've bought five yokes of oxen and I, I'm going to go try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I've married a wife, so I can't come. And the servant returned and he reported all this to his master. And then the owner of the house became angry. And said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant replied, what you've ordered has been done and there's still room. And so the master told his servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. Watch this. So that my house may be full. So that my house may be full. God's will is that his house is full. It's full of people getting right with God. It's full of people learning and growing spiritually and becoming all that God wants them to become. Would you stop for just a moment? And I want you to look around God's house here. Could you, could you do that? Just look around. Look around you. Look up in the risers. You know, we've got quite a few people here today, but we also have a lot of empty seats, don't we? This house isn't full. And so God's will hasn't been accomplished 
until this house is full, and then we can fill it again, and then we can fill it again. And then we can plant a campus across town and, and other areas around Acadiana. This is the will of God, that his house would be full. Uh, look around one more time. Look at those empty seats. Would you do it? Would you just look around for just a minute and see those empty seats? Because here's what I want you to remember. Every one of those empty seats represents someone in this area that's lost without God. Someone who's going to spend eternity separated from God in a place of eternal torment. If we don't reach them and we don't bring them to the Father's house. Are you hearing me today? God wants people saved. So we must want people saved. Now, every believer has a role in the growing church. We're reading a lot of scripture today, but it's so important for us to look at what God's will is together, and that's revealed through his word. So let's look at another passage together. Now in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to the church there at Ephesus, and in chapter 4, verse 11, he says this, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, and he lists five different gifts that God gave the local church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people. Now stop for just a moment. How many consider yourself one of God's people? Raise your hand. If you, you, you consider yourself one of God's people, come on, you belong to him. So what do pastors and evangelists and prophets and apostles and pastors, teachers, what do they do? They equip you. They equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church. Who's responsible for causing the church to grow? God's people that are equipped by the five-fold ministry offices. Uh, we build the church up together. We strengthen the church together. We grow the church together. Look at verse 13. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then, somebody say then. Then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. Did you see each part has its own special work to do? Uh, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So God wants his church growing. He wants his church full of love. How does it happen? It happens when everybody's doing their part. At least nod. Would you just at least nod at me, you know? If you can't give me an amen, at least kind of nod and smile, okay? We all have a role to play in the growth of the church. The church grows when we all do our part. So I want to break this passage down with you, and I'll give you four things to consider about your role in seeing our church grow. Now, look, we're not just interested in numeric growth. We want to grow numerically. We want more and more people to find Christ as Savior and Lord of their life. But we also want to see those people mature and become all God has called them to be. Then they will assist us in reaching even more numerically. So we want every kind of growth. But let's look at how it's done according to Ephesians chapter 4 as we all do our part. Number one, the first thing I'll point out that Paul says is that believers should be connected to leadership that equips them for service. Now with each one of these four things I'm going to point out, I'm going to share with you the measures we use here at Crossroads uh, in order to achieve them. And what I want you to do, no matter whether you've been here for 30 days or 30 years, is I want you to embrace those measures. They're the measures that your church has put in place, your pastors have put in place. And so I want you to embrace those. In order to see you connect with leadership that can equip you, we want you to go through next steps. We mention it every week. And if you haven't gone through next steps, again, I don't care if you've been here 20 years, go through next steps. You're going to discover what this church is all about and what your role is in the vision of our church, what God wants to do to use you in mighty ways. We also want to see you get on a serve team. We have a number of different teams that help us to do what we do week to week. You may not be aware of this, but it literally takes hundreds and hundreds of people every Sunday to achieve what we achieve. And so we would love to get you on a team. Each one of you has unique gifting. You have unique talent to contribute. You have 
uh, unique passions, things that you get excited about. And we want to harness all of that to one of our teams where you can serve and you can make a difference. In fact, on the way in today, we gave you a card that is really just a serve team sign up. And I want you to pull that card out right now. And if you're not currently serving on a team at Crossroads Church, then what I'd love for you to do is just give us the information we've asked for. You, there's a number of different suggestions of teams that you could serve on. You can check off the one you're interested in and someone will get in touch with you over the next week or so to let you know how to connect how to start serving, and, and you can see God use you in a mighty, mighty way. So the first thing you need to do, as a, a believer, you need to connect to leadership that's going to equip you for service. Secondly, here's how you help the church grow. And you see what God wants come to pass. Number two, uh, believers unite and mature. I want you to notice in this passage that maturity is linked to unity. You can't you can't separate those things. You're never going to mature spiritually isolated off by yourself. It's one of the reasons why we want everyone who was once a part of Crossroads and now since COVID, you're reluctant to come back and reconnect. Listen, if there's immunity issues uh, with you, if there's health issues, we understand that. Otherwise, man, it's time to come back. Come back to connect because you need to see that unity and maturity walk hand in hand. And you're not going to grow, you're not going to mature if you're not united with the family of God. What are those measures that we've put in place to unite you? Well, let me describe a couple of those. One is our growth track. Now, there's currently now three phases to our growth track. Each one occupies an entire small group semester, which is about three months. And so what we want to do is see everyone go through that growth track. How many want to grow? Say, I do. So we've put this growth measure in place to help you. For years, we've had one phase of the growth track. We call it freedom, and it's our deliverance track. If you've been a believer for some time, and many have uh, carried things over from their old former life before Christ into their new life in Christ, and it's still you know, uh, creates dysfunction in how they live and how they relate with others. And we want to see you delivered from all of that. And God can deliver you. We want to see you move into freedom and experience all that God has for you. Hundreds have gone through this track. Hundreds have been set free. And you can be one of them. Go through freedom. Our second phase that we instituted a couple of years ago is called Foundations. It's our discipleship track. And it's where you learn how to pray effectively. It's where you learn how to study the Bible and apply it to your life in a very effective way. It's where you learn to live a holy life that pleases God. Uh, it, how to connect with the family of God and get the most out of the relationships we have there in the family of God. How to go about doing good works that make a difference and how to share your faith with others. All of these are these spiritual disciplines that we teach you. This is a class that I oversee and people are learning how to follow Jesus in a way that helps them really succeed at all God wants them to be and to do as they go through our foundations track. So I want to see you sign up for that. And then the third brand new phase we have to our spiritual growth track, we're calling fundamentals. And it is our discovery track. It's an apologetics track. The term apologetics just means the explanation of our faith. So fundamentals uh, really focus us on what we believe as Christians and why we believe it. If you have questions about the Christian faith, here's where your questions can be answered. Pastor Bud Plake is going to be overseeing this phase of the growth track. He's helped us to create the curriculum, and it's incredibly insightful. We'll make the case for why the Bible's reliable and why you should build everything you believe about God on his word. We'll make the case for Christ being different from any other religious leader that's ever existed and why he is actually one with God, God himself. Uh, we'll make the case for a lot of the 21st century questions people have about Christianity. We'll lean into that and help you with that. So whether you have questions yourself or whether you want to answer someone else's questions and just don't know how, go through fundamentals. I'm telling you, it's going to help you so much. But it's one of the measures we've put in place where believers unite and believers mature. The other one is our small groups. 
Our growth track is small group based, but we have all kind of small groups, Bible stories, uh, Bible stories, Bible studies, uh, interest groups, just to connect you. Because when you're connecting with other believers, through that relational connection, God will begin to help you grow and mature. The third thing that Paul says, along with believers connecting to leadership that equipped them, and believers uniting with other believers and maturing in their faith. Thirdly, he says, believers speak the truth. And if there was an ever, if there was ever a time when the church needs to rise up and speak the truth in love, it's today. How many believe that? Let me admonish you on how that can happen very practically in your life day to day. One is just share your story. If you're a, a follower of Jesus, you have a story. The story includes who you were before you met Jesus, how he saved you and redeemed you, and who you've become since you made Jesus Lord of your life. And people need to hear that story. And I wanna see you sharing that story with people that need hope in the hour that we're living in. You can also use your influence to influence those that look to you for leadership and everyone leads someone. You can use your influence to impact someone's life for the cause of Christ and share the gospel with them. And you can use a simple invitation. You might've noticed as you sat down today, we had our friend day invite there for you. I hope you'll take it home and you'll bring it to someone that you're gonna bring back to church with you next Sunday. It's uh, it's going to be our small group expo next Sunday. Uh, Your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, whoever you bring with you will get to see the emphasis Crossroads Church places on community. You know, over the last year, people have been so isolated. They really are hungry for connection and for fellowship. And when they hear us describe all the different connecting groups that we have, I think it's going to be very attractional for someone you've been wanting to really get saved. And you want to see that person connect to your church. Next week, you could use that friend day invite to bring somebody here and, uh, and see them make those kinds of connection, a connection to Christ, a, a connection to our church. And so we want to encourage you to do that. The fourth and last thing I see in Ephesians chapter 4 that Paul describes is where believers help each other to grow. We help each other, don't we? We help each other grow. That's what the church is all about. Instead of fussing with one another, putting one another down, we should be building each other up. We need maturity to happen in the body of Christ, don't we? If you don't know the church needs to mature, you haven't been paying attention to social media, and good for you. I'm ready to stop paying attention to any social media myself. But if you do look at social media, you say so, you'll see so many of us are divided and fighting each other. We need to build each other up. We need to help each other grow. So we want to see you not just be a part of a small group. We want to see you lead a small group. At some point, you have interests that you'll share with others. You'll connect over that interest. And man, we can help each other grow. You can also promote the systems we have in place. And that'll be helpful. What do you mean by that? Well, let's just say you do bring someone to Friend Day. They give their heart to Christ and begin to attend our church. Instead of just pointing them to next steps or pointing them to the growth track, why don't you go attend with them? Well, I've already attended. It won't hurt you to attend again. Maybe attend dozens of times over the next few years as you lead more and more and more of your coworkers or neighbors to Christ and you kind of promote our systems by going there with them and going through those measures that are going to help them grow and they're not going to hurt you either, right? So these are all things that we can do that Paul says will really grow the church. Let me wrap this up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, here's what Paul said. He said, I planted the seed in your hearts. And Apollos watered that seed, but it was God who made it grow. Notice, God makes the seed grow once it's planted and watered. What every one of us have to ask is, what am I I doing What am I currently doing to plant seeds? What am I currently doing to water seeds? the seeds that have been planted. That's when God steps in and really gives us the kind of growth he says he wants us to experience. I uh, I wanna share a story with you that that some of you may have heard me tell before, but I think it bears repeating today. Um, I wanna get candid with you uh, as we wrap this up today. Is it okay if I just share right from my heart? I gotta be honest with you. As we, uh, a few months ago, as we just 
said, okay, we're going to reopen and we're going to start doing live services again. We didn't know what to expect. We had no idea what to expect. Um, but one of the things that we've seen, one of the things that we've experienced is a reluctance on people that have served God for years and even served on our teams for years to get back involved again. What we've heard over and over and over is, hey, you know, we think it's time we just take a little break. And I get that there are seasons when someone maybe needs to step back for a little while. I don't think it ever should be a very long time. But I think for the most part, we ought to always be engaged. Again, it's how we mature. It's how we grow. It's a huge part of our spiritual development. But we've heard one after the other say, I just think I'm going to take a little break. I'm just going to sit back. I just felt like it was important for me to look at you in the eyes today and say to you, hell ain't taking a break, y'all. In fact, as your pastor, I need you to know, we're fighting darkness like never before. There are more suicide attempts, more divorce, more isolation, more depression that we're dealing with than we've ever dealt with before. Hell's not taking a break, so we can't. Man, we gotta step up, we gotta roll our sleeves, we gotta make this thing happen. I feel like so many people are just kind of going, well, let's just wait and, and let's just see what happens. Since when was that ever the posture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, never, never. And it doesn't need to be now. When I was a youth pastor here years ago, I had a friend down in New Iberia that was going to put on an outreach around the Halloween season he called Hell House. I'd been youth pastor here for several years, and we'd had a lot of success, and the, the youth group was growing by leaps and bounds, and so many young people were getting right with God, and we were discipling them, and it had gained me some notoriety around the country. I was traveling and speaking at conferences and whatnot. And my friend put this outreach on, and he knew we had some drama teams in our, in our youth ministry, and we had our master's commission program that always would use drama in their outreach. And so he, he asked me if I would send some students down there to help him. And so I did. Here's what he, he did as an outreach. He, he took an old abandoned house there in New Iberia, and he converted that old house. Every room in the house became a different scene where they acted out and depicted ways that teenagers die in America every day. He had a drug overdose scene. He had a drunk driving accident scene. He had a, a botched abortion, a, a drug deal that went bad. And, and all this stuff, all these different scenes. And so they lined up by the thousands to go through this. And, um, and, and the last scene that you would come to was the crucifixion. And it was there that they'd present the gospel to these thousands of people that went through and you had one or two doors you had to exit by. One said heaven, one said hell. Whichever door you exited, there was people there ready to lead you to Christ. And literally, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people got saved, got right with God. It was powerful. So many of our students were involved. And again, this was my friend putting it on. And so I thought I'd go down there and support them, and I'd go through it myself. Don and I and some of our close friends went down. And we started going through this. Now, what I didn't know was they had a means of communicating all through the house, and they set me up as a practical joke. I'd been through several of these scenes, and y'all, they were just gripping. They were, I was emotional. I mean, a lot of our students were the lead actors in these depictions of way kids are dying. And I'm just telling you, I was on the brink of tears already. I got to the suicide scene. The young man playing the scene was a young man that I'd led to the Lord just a couple of years before. At the end of that scene, he put a gun up to his head. He pulled the trigger. He slumped over. Now, there were these guides that would lead you room to room. They were dressed like the death angel, all in black with skeleton faces painted. They were creepy. He had had his back to us as all this unfolded in the suicide scene. We're just caught up in the moment of this when all of a sudden the death guide says, Jeff Abels, I almost passed out. <laughs> he began to turn around towards us to face us. And as he did, he said, I hear you're reaching a lot of teenagers, Jeff. And by this time, I realized they're playing a joke on me. And, you know, we start kind of chuckling. And that's when he walked over to that teenager, slumped over. And he sat him up right limp, put his arm around him. He looked at me and he said, reaching teenagers, Jeff, so are we. That 
that moment marked me forever. If you've been coming to Crossroads for some time, if you ever wondered why at the end of every service, every event, every outreach, every, everything we do, we give an opportunity for people to give their heart to Christ. If you ever wondered why we do that, you can trace it back to that moment. That moment where I realized no matter how large our church gets, hell's still reaching more people than we are. God wants this church to grow. And I want what God wants. And so we all need to do our part.